Greetings, everybody. Welcome back to Learning as a Hobby. Um, this In this channel, if this is the first time you're joining me, well, first of all, let me say welcome. Um, in the, the whole purpose of my channel here is uh, I'm, I'm, I have a project where I want to teach myself physics. So um, I wanted to do that in sort of like a structured way, sort of like the way you would do that if you were getting a physics degree in, uh, you know, like a four-year college. So um, since I'm just starting out, I sort of constructed my like freshman, I guess my freshman year, if you like. Um, but And that is comprised of single variable calculus, multivariable calculus, and then sort of like, uh, I guess, physics 101 or something like, a, you know, introductory freshman physics course, uh, which I guess would go over like Newtonian mechanics, things like that. <clears throat> So for my single variable calculus, um, you can see I already have a playlist on um, this book that I'm going through, uh, Calculus by Michael Spivak. That's my single variable calculus uh, book that, I, that I'm using to teach myself single variable calculus. I'm uh, almost done with chapter two. Well, I, the, my lecture, my um, notes on chapter one and chapter two are already, the videos on that are already up. Um, I posted my video on the exercises that I did for chapter one and I part posted half of the exercises uh, for chapter two, and I still have to do part two of that. Um, so if you look on, on the channel, you should see the videos for this. But in I want to start my playlist now for uh, what I'm doing for multivariable calculus. And for that, I'm using this book by uh, Theodore Schifrin. So I want to talk a little bit about this before I, I go into my notes for chapter one. Um, I do have <clears throat> sort of like an intro video to the channel, sort of like outline what I was going to do for my this sort of like first semester. Um, uh, and I mentioned this book by James uh, Stewart, um, Calculus. This is a good book. Um, it's a little bit less advanced than the, the two books that I'm I'm using here, uh, but the the two books I'm choosing choosing for single and multivariable calculus, I think complement each other really well. So I'll talk about more about that in a minute. But if you uh, have never taken a multivariable or single variable calculus before, you might want to actually start with a book like uh, Stewart. Um, you can get the, you can see this doorstop of a book. Um, you can get um, a book like this that contains both topics. So Stuart, uh, if you get the full version, uh, has single variable calculus and multivariable calculus in it, as well as other things uh, as well. I think has he has like a chapter, on um, a small chapter on ordinary differential equations and some supplementary um, chapters that you can find online uh, that deal with like Fourier series. And, and so there's a lot of stuff in this book, uh, but it's uh, the maturity level for this is not as high as the ones that I'm choosing. Um, the reason I did that, uh, that I decided to do that is because I've already gone through um, Stewart's book. So if it's your first, you know, experience with the calculus, I would say start here and then take a look at the books I'm going through. But if you're, you know, a motivated student, you could um, just as well start with the ones that I'm using. <clears throat> um, so let me explain uh, the books that I that I chose uh, to use for this project. Uh, I put a lot of thought into. Um, I wanted to do choose books that. Uh, satisfied certain criteria. So for example, I mean, this, the, if you look at the title of this channel, it's learning as a hobby. So I wanted the books to be fun to work through because I, you know, I wanted to do this as, you know, a hobby. So uh, I chose Michael Spivak's book because for um, single variable calculus, because the problems especially looked really entertaining to me and the topics in the book, uh, I think were, I found interesting. So um, that was sort of like, you know, the main criteria, I guess, that I wanted. Uh, and then, you know, also I wanted it to be kind of affordable and, uh, you know, I wanted books that would be good for self-study. So um, I think Michael Spivak's book is good for that. <clears throat> uh, you can learn completely from that book without having access to an instructor or anything uh, of that, you know, nature, um, particularly because there's a solutions manual to the book as well, if you want to check your your answers to the problems. Um, but for multivariable calculus, I had several choices as well. Uh, like I said, you could still do uh, Stuart if you prefer, because uh, he has everything in there. Uh, but 
um, the books that I had considered, uh, in addition to um, uh, Schifrin, were uh, let me start with well, let me start with this one actually. Um, since I was going through multivariable, uh, sorry, since I was going through um, Spivak's calculus, he does has a have a multivariable calculus book too. Um, it's very uh, small and terse. It's called Calculus on Manifolds. Uh, I did actually go through this book uh, in uh, when I you know went to college. So I've actually done this book already, which is one of the reasons why I didn't want to go through this book again because I've already done it. Um, but also I think this book as a self-study book is not the best choice. And that's because of its sort of like terse nature. Um, it's sort of written in more like the French style, like like a baby Rudin kind of. Um, it's a bit dry. The, the, the book is really well written. Uh, it's just, I don't think it's in uh, written in a style that works so great for, you know, what I'm trying to do here. So um, for those reasons, I decided uh, not to work through this book again. Um, I wanted to do something, you know, that I hadn't done before that I would find, you know, fun to go through. So, uh, but this is a great book. It's also very cheap. So uh, if this sounds like a better option for you, then you can pick it up. Uh, the, it has the also, um, it has the, the uh, positive that, you know, it's written by the same author as the calculus book I'm going through. But anyway, that was a uh, one choice. Uh, the other choice, which I really came close to choosing instead of Spivak, but uh, it's this this book, uh, Second Year Calculus by David Bursud. Um, I worked through his one his um, he has two books on analysis. I worked through his first book on analysis and loved it so much that I got so excited that he had a a uh, multivariable calculus book. Um, as well, I haven't read through this one, so uh, I wanted to, you know, do that, and I still may do that in the future at some point. Uh, but I don't want to get too crazy with, you know, all different books. I want to stick to one book per topic, and you know, really concentrate it on, on it, and uh, you know, do get the most out of a single book. And then maybe later on, I'll look at other ones. But this one came came it came down very close to this one and uh, Schifrin's book, uh, particularly because, like I said, I like Brasud's writing. But also, this book has uh, a more physics leaning um, style to it, uh, or st I don't know if style is the word, but like the the content is geared more towards uh, physical applications. Um, you know, I think he talks about like orbital mechanics in here and, and uh, there's a bunch of physics topics, but uh, this one ended up losing out to um, Schifrin because I just, the, the problems in Schifrin look like so much fun. And uh, I'm sure the problems in this book are, are good. They just don't look as interesting to me as the problems that the, you know, the, the curated problems that um, Schifrin uh, has in his book. So that was one of the that's one of the main uh way things that i'm you know taking as a criterion for the book is that the problem set has to be the problem sets have to be really good and interesting and fun um that's not to say that these aren't but i, I just looking through the Schifrin's book excuse me it looks like uh i i would have more fun going through those problems so for, for that reason um i decided against Brasud and, and i'm going to go with Schifrin. Uh, another uh, honorable mention i should say also is lang's uh, calculus of several several variables um this is a, again a well written book but i don't think it's at uh, the level particularly the problems are not at the level that i wanted the it, the problems in this book are a little bit too easy uh but again if it, if you have no experience with multi multivariable calculus this might be a good choice and i will say uh one of the the should i say the the this book handles um the multivariable taylor polynomials and and taylor ser series uh in one of the best ways that I've seen in a, in a multivariable calculus textbook. Um, so if anything, I would say, may, if you can find this like in a library or something, uh, or if you want to, you know, if you want to find a used copy online, uh, this book is worth worth reading through and doing the exercises just on the, the uh, multivariable Taylor um, series formulas and everything. So, uh, but anyway, th this, I didn't want to do this one on the channel because, like I said, uh, I think the problem sets uh, were just not up to what I wanted. So um, 
that brings me then to to Schifrin. Um, so like I said, I chose this book because it covers everything that I wanted. So it goes all the way up to like differential forms and stuff. There's some to topology in there. There's uh, a lot of integrated linear algebra uh, in with the, the, to the topics. Um, and the topics that he includes are interesting. And there's a lot of physics applications in here as well. Um, but mostly, like I said, I like his writing style and the the problems, the, the um, problem sets are analogous to the problem sets in, in uh, Spivak in that they're entertaining. They look really entertaining. So um, I, I enjoy solving math problems. And if you're watching this channel, I'm sure you do as well. Uh, so this book uh, won out for those for those reasons. And actually, there's one other. Actually, there's a few other reasons. But the, the main other one is that this book um, covers Fubini's theorem in one of the most uh, in, in one of the best ways that I've seen in uh, a multivariable calculus book, uh, like, you know, the way that that Lang does for the Taylor, the multivariable Taylor series, uh, I think this book covers Sfubini's theorem, uh, the best out of any textbook, math, uh, multivariable mathematics textbook that I've seen. So I wanted to, to um, go through that. Uh, section on here. So we're going to do, we're going to choose this, or I'm going to choose this one for uh, my multivariable calculus course. We're going to go through the whole book. Um, we'll start in chapter one today. I'm going to just go through my note, the notes that I took on, on the book. Um, and I'll, I'll actually read the, the uh, prologue to the book that he has too. So this way you can get a sense of uh, his uh, pedagogical philosophy uh, on writing the book. Uh, there's one other thing before I get to my, my notes uh, that I want to mention about this book, and that is uh, Theodore Schifrin um, has posted on YouTube the lectures for this book that he, you know, the lectures for the class that this book is used for uh, online. You can see them for free on YouTube. Let me uh, share my screen so you could see. So here, here's the, uh, uh, his Math 350, uh, 3510, which is, uh, so this book, basically, he splits into two different courses. One focuses mainly on differentiation, and the second course uh, focuses on integration. Um, so he has all of the lectures for this entire book posted here on uh, on uh, YouTube. So what I'll do is I'm going to, let me just stop screen sharing for a second. Uh, in the description bar below, I'll post the link to that series of lectures if you want to watch them, uh, because, uh, like I said, in, uh, you know, the introductory video, I guess, to the channel, uh, when I write my notes here, they're just going to be skeletons. They're just like summaries of the chapter. So, you sh you know, it's not um, it's not enough just to look at that and then do the problems. You have to you should read the, the actual textbook itself. Um, so you should pick up a copy if you want to do this and, and read through it. And um, like I said, my lecture notes here, are just my summary of uh, the notes and everything of the chapter. <clears throat> so anyway, I'm babbling here now. So let me um, get started on on the book. I'll like I said, I'll start by reading the prologue just so you can get a sense of um, his philosophy in the book. <clears throat> and then we'll I'll write, I'll go through my notes. Chapter one is is relatively short, so that shouldn't take a, a very long time for today. And then after that, the next video in this series I'll post is uh, the solutions to these selected exercises that I'm going to do for chapter one. OK, so here's the preface. Um, this is Theodore Schifrin talking. Uh, I began writing this text as I thought a brand new course combining linear algebra and a rigorous approach to multivar sorry i began writing this text as i taught a brand new course combining linear algebra and a rigorous approach to multivariable calculus some of the students had already taken a proof oriented single variable calculus course using spivak's beautiful book calculus surprise surprise <laughs> um, <clears throat> but many had not 
there were sophomores who wanted a more challenging entree to higher level mathematics, as well as freshmen who'd scored a five on the advanced placement calculus BC exam. My goal was to include all the standard computational material found in the usual linear algebra and multivariable calculus courses and more interweaving the material as effectively as possible and include complete proofs. Although there have been a number of books that include both the linear algebra and the calculus material, they have tended to segregate the material. Advanced calculus books treat the rigorous multivariable calculus, but presume the students have already mastered linear algebra. I wanted to integrate the material so as to emphasize the recurring theme of implicit versus explicit that persists in linear algebra and analysis. In every linear algebra course, we should learn how to go back and forth between a system of equations and a parametrization of its solution set. But the same problem occurs in principle in calculus. To solve constrained maximum minimum problems, we must either parametrize the constraint set or use Lagrange multipliers. To integrate over a curve or surface, we need a parametric representation. Of course, in the linear case, one can globally go back and forth. It's not so easy in the nonlinear case, but as we'll learn, it should at least be possible in principle locally. The prereqs for this book are a solid background in single variable calculus and, if not some experience writing proofs, a strong interest in grappling with them. In presenting the material, I have included plenty of examples, clear proofs, and significant motivation for the crucial concepts. We all know that to learn and enjoy mathematics, one must work lots of problems, from the routine to the more challenging. To this end, I have provided numerous exercises of varying levels of difficulty, both computational and more proof-oriented. Some of the proof exercises require the students merely to understand and modify a proof in the text. Others may require a good deal of ingenuity. I also ask students for lots of examples and counterexamples. Generally speaking, exercises are arranged in order of increasing difficulty. To offer a bit more guidance, I have marked with an asterisk those problems to which short answers, hints, or in some cases, complete solutions are given at the back of the book. As a guide to the new teacher, I have marked with a sharp sign uh, some important exercises to which reference is made later. Uh, we're definitely going to do all of those that um, he has that he says will be used later on. So uh, an instructor an instructor solution manual is available from the publisher. Uh, I don't have the solutions manual, so um, I can't talk about that. Um, comments on contents. The linear algebraic material with which we begin the course in chapter one is concrete, establishes the link with geometry, and is a good self-contained setting for working on uh, for working on proofs. We introduce vectors, dot products, subspaces, and linear transformations, and matrix computations. At this early stage, we emphasize the two interpretations of multiplying a matrix A by a vector X, the linear equations viewpoint, considering the dot products of the rows of A with X, and the linear combinations viewpoint, taking the linear combination of the columns of A, weighted by the coordinates of X. We end the chapter with a discussion of 2 by 2 and 3 by 3 determinants, area, volume, and the cross product. In chapter two, we begin by making transition to calculus, introducing scalar functions of a vector variable, their graphs and their level sets, and vector valued functions. We introduce the requisite language of open and closed sets, sequences and limits and continuity, including the proofs of the usual limit theorems. Generally, however, I give the short shrift in lecture as I don't have the time to emphasize delta epsilon arguments. Uh, we come to the concept of differential calculus in chapter three. We quickly introduce partial and directional derivatives as immediate to calculate and then come to the definition of differentiability, the characterization of differentiable functions, and the standard differentiation rules. We give the gradient vector its own brief section in which we emphasize its geometric meaning. Then comes a section on curves in which we mention Kepler's laws. So that's a nice physical application. Uh, the second is proved in the text and the other two are left as exercises. That's That sounds exciting. <laughs> uh, arc length and curvature of a space curve. 
In the first four sections of chapter four, we give an accelerated treatment of Gaussian elimination, including a proof of uniqueness of reduced row echelon, sorry, reduced echelon form, and the theory of linear systems, the standard material on linear independence and dimension, including a brief mention of abstract vector spaces, and the four fundamental subspaces associated to a matrix. In the last section, we begin our assault on the nonlinear case, introducing with no proofs the implicit function theorem and the notion of a manifold. Chapter five is a blend of topology, calculus, and linear algebra, quadratic forms, and projections. We start with the topological notion of compactness and prove the maximum value theorem in higher dimensions. We then turn to the calculus of applied maximum minimum problems and then to the analysis of the second derivative test and the Hessian. Then comes out, uh, then comes one of the most important topics in applications, Lagrange multipliers with a rigorous proof. In the last section, we return to linear algebra to discuss projections from both the explicit and implicit approaches, least squares solutions of inconsistent systems, and Gram-Schmidt uh, process, and a brief discussion of abstract inner product spaces, including a nice proof of Lagrange interpolation. That sounds fun. Uh, chapter six is a brief but sophisticated introduction to the inverse and implicit function theorems. We present our favorite proof using the contraction mapping pr principle, which is both more elegant and works just fine in the infinite dimensional setting. In the last section, we prove that all three definitions of a manifold are locally equivalent. The implicit representation, the parametric representation, and the representation as a graph. Uh, in the year-long course that I teach, I find it, I have time to treat this chapter only lightly. In chapter seven, we study multi-dimensional uh, multi Riemann integral. In the first two sections, we deal predominantly with the theory of the multiple integral, and then Fubini's theorem, and the computation of iterated integrals. So uh, like I was saying a minute ago, this book treats Fubini's theorem excellently. Uh, I would argue, at least from, from my opinion, from other books that I've seen, uh, I feel like this book treats Fubini's theorem the best out of any of the multivariable calculus books that I've I've read. Um, where was I? Uh, then we introduce, as is customary in a typical multivariable calculus course, polar, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates and various physical applications. We conclude the chapter with a careful treatment of determinants, which will play a crucial role in chapters eight and nine, and a proof of the change of variables theorem. Uh, in single variable calculus, one of the truly impressive results is the fundamental theorem of calculus. In chapter eight, we start by laying the groundwork for the analogous multidimensional result, introducing differential forms in a very explicit fashion. We then parallel a traditional vector calculus course, introducing line integrals and Green's theorem, uh, surface integrals and flux, and then finally stating and proving the general Stokes theorem for compact oriented manifolds. We do not skimp on concrete and non-trivial examples throughout. In section 8.6, we introduce the standard terminology of divergence and curl and give the classical versions of Stokes and divergence theorem along with some applications to physics. In section 8.7, we begin to illustrate the power of Stokes theorem by proving the fundamental the fundamental theorem of algebra, a special case of the argument principle, and the Harry Ball theorem from topology. In chapter nine, we complete our study of linear algebra, including standard material on change of basis with a geometric slant, eigenvalues, eigenvectors, and discussions uh, discussion of diagonalizability. The, rem uh, the remainder of the chapter is devoted to applications, difference, and differential equations, so that's kind of neat, uh, and a brief discussion of flows and their relations, uh, their relation to the divergence theorem of chapter eight. We close with the spectral theorem. Uh, you don't often see that that type of material in a multivariable calculus book, so that's kind of cool, with the exception of section 3.3, which relies on chapter eight, and the proof of the spectral theorem, which relies on section four of chapter five. Topics in this chapter can be covered at any time after completing chapter four. We have included a glossary of notations and a quick compilation of relevant results from trigonometry and single variable calculus, including a short table of integrals, along with a much requested list of the Greek alphabet. There are over 800 exercises in the text with many with multiple parts. 
Here are a few of the particularly interesting and somewhat unusual exercises included in the text. Uh, I won't go through these, but he he just uh, you know talks about some of the interesting problems. So this is what I'm talking about for a book um, that you're looking for if you're doing self study. Um, you really want to choose a well curated uh, a book with a well curated um, bunch of exercises. Uh, and it sounds like Schifrin has really done that here. Um, that, so that's something I was really looking for. Um, the the, the uh, problems in this book look really fun. So uh, anyway, he lists some of the, the more um, unusual and interesting examples uh, in this some of the sections. Uh, what else? Okay, there's another uh, part here, possible ways to use this book, and then I'll get to my notes for chapter one. Uh, possible ways to use this book. I have been using the text for a number of years in a course for highly motivated freshmen and sophomores. Since this is the first serious course in mathematics for many of them, because of time limitations, I must give somewhat short shrift to many of the complicated analytic proofs. For example, I only have time to talk about the inverse and implicit function theorems and to sketch the proof of the change of variables theorem and do not include all the technical aspects of the proof of Stokes theorem. On the other hand, I cover most of the linear algebra material thoroughly. I do plenty of examples and assign a broad range of homework problems from the computational to the more challenging proofs. I would also be quite sorry, it would also be quite appropriate to use the text in courses in advanced calculus or multivariable analysis, depending on the student's background. I might bypass the linear algebra material or assign some of its review reading, sorry, sorry assign some of it as review reading and highlight a few crucial results. I would spend more time on the analytic material, especially in chapters three, six, and seven, and treat Stokes theorem from the differential form viewpoint very carefully, including the applications in section 8.7. The approach of the text will give the student uh, give the students a very hands on understanding of rather abstract material in such courses, I would spend more time in class on proofs and assign a greater proportion of theoretical homework problems. All right, and then after that he uh, has, you know, the um, acknowledgments of you know, people that he thinks uh, he also has a, a, a website which maybe I'll try to include in the uh, description bar as well, in addition to the link to his um, uh, his lecture, lecture videos on YouTube. All right. All right. So that's the, the prologue. Uh, we're going to get to chapter one now, or at least my summary of it, the, the notes that I took down. Uh, actually, I didn't write them down. I'm going to actually go through through them with you on the whiteboard. But uh, chapter one deals with, uh, it's very, very straightforward introductory chapter on vectors and matrices. So um, let's let's actually do that now. So let me go to the whiteboard. All right, so um, there are basically a bunch of definitions here in chapter one. He's explaining concepts. So uh, let's actually just go through the definitions and everything. There's a couple of uh, geometric proofs that he does, so I'll go through those as well. Um, so this is chapter one. Uh, Schifrin. Multivariable mathematics. Chapter one. Uh, there, I'll start with the exercises that he recommends that you do. So uh, the recommended exercises from chapter one. Are number 12 and 13. So we'll definitely do those in the next video. Um, and I might do one or two of the other the other problems in the the exercise set as well. Excuse me. Um, there are some interesting looking um, like geometric problems, uh, Euclidean Euclidean geometry problems, uh, in the first problem set. So maybe I'll include one or two of those uh, in the uh, when I do the video on the exercises. All right. So uh, let's get to the what he talks about in the chapter. So he starts with uh, the definition of a point in and dimensional space. All 
So a point. in Rn, which is n-dimensional space, uh, is an n-tuple of real numbers right, and he also says you can think geometric uh, geometrically about a a point either as a you know just a a um like a you know dot in space like a point in space or you can you know, just from the geometric viewpoint or you can think of it as an arrow which we would call like a vector uh, so you can interpret an n tuple as a point in space or as an arrow with its base at the origin and its head at the point. So let me uh, illustrate this with a couple of easy to visualize examples. So consider uh, may I'll do a, a two dimensional example and um, a three dimensional example. So consider the vector x with coordinates 1, 2. And uh, we could also do, let's call a vector y. So maybe this one is a three tuple. Let's say 1, 2, 3. Right, so x is a two tuple because it's there's two numbers. Um, you call them the components. You, can, uh, you guys, uh, if you've taken algebra, you've, you're familiar with uh, you know, thinking about two tuples when you're graph, you know, because you've graphed things in the, the Cartesian plane. Um, you might not be familiar with three tuples or three dimensional, as familiar with three dimensional space, but the uh, same kind of concept. So, for example, in R2, I can graph the vector x. This is the x axis. This is the y axis. So, let's say this is one on the x axis. This is two on the y-axis, then this would be the point with the coordinates one, two, or you can think of it as an arrow. So you start at the origin and the arrow points toward the point. And so you can think of it either, uh, either geometric interpretation, right? And we could do a similar thing for y, only y lives in three-dimensional space as opposed to as opposed to uh, two-dimensional space. Uh, it's harder to draw in three dimensions because you have to use perspective. So just imagine that all of those, all of these angles are, you know, right angles. They should all be right angles. If I want to draw the vector one, two, three, let's call this the x-axis, this the y-axis, and this the z-axis. Say this is one on the x-axis. This is two 
on the y-axis. This is three on the z-axis. Uh, let me draw. So here, if you go to one on the x-axis, uh, this is going to be difficult to draw here with this XP pen. So here, go to one on the x-axis and then go go over to two on the y-axis parallel to it okay, and then go up three units over here and you get the point with coordinates one, two, three. So if I just erase the scaffolding here, that would be the point one, two, three. Or you can uh, think of it as an arrow starting at the origin and ending Oops, and ending at that point, right? So similar type of thing uh, in R2 and R3, just we're up one dimension. And you can, even though you can't visualize it in your head, you can make the same generalization for n tuples. So for example, a four tuple of numbers is a, a vector or an arrow or a point that lives in four dimensional space and so on. Okay. Um, next thing is he defines the zero vector. The zero vector. Oh, I should also say, you, you can think of these n tuples, we, we're, we can call them vectors. Um, you can, geometrically, you can think of the vector as the arrow uh, interpretation. So the zero vector is the n tuple where all its coordinates are zero. Right, so usually we, we write the zero vector like this, right? So for example, if the zero vector is in R2, then it has, it's a two tuple of zeros. If it's in R3, it's a three tuple of zeros and et cetera. So if it has, uh, if it lives in N dimensional space, then it has N copies of zeros, okay? This would be in Rn. This is in R2. This is in R3. Okay, so uh, it's the the point or the the arrow that corresponds geometrically to the origin in uh, either two dimensional space or you know, three-dimensional space or so on. You can think of it uh, a one tuple also as just a, a point on the number line. So for example, in one-dimensional space, the zero vector would just be zero. Uh, all right. Um, we need a definition uh, of when two vectors are equivalent. So here... Um, two vectors are equivalent uh, if they have the same direction and length. Now, I haven't talked about length yet, but you I'm sure you have an intuitive notion of what we mean by length. We'll formalize that in a second. Um, uh, so two vectors are equivalent if they have some, the same direction and length. So for example, let's say we have 
two vectors in the Cartesian plane in R2. Let's say we have the vector starting at the point. Let's say this is the point A. This is the point B. Let's say we have an arrow starting at A and ending at B. Right. Uh, we would consider that to be the same vector as maybe I'll do this in a different color. As the vector starting at the origin that points in the same direction as the vector from A to B and has the same length. So it's kind of hard to write it on this board straight with this XP pen. But uh, if you could see that those two lines are supposed to have the same length line segments are supposed to have the same length in the same direction. So let's call this this vector, the red vector, we'll call it x. Is actually, that vector is actually equal to the blue vector, which I'll call y. Right. So even though they, they start and end at different points, because they have the same direction and the same length, they're considered the same thing. All right, the red version here is sometimes referred to as a located vector. Because it doesn't start at the origin. But if, like I said, even though they're located in different parts of the plane, if their length is the same and their direction is the same, then they're considered the same vector, right? Um, you can calculate the the blue vector from the, the red vector by using the, uh, let me change back here, uh, you, by using the coordinates. For example, for uh, A here, A has, should have coordinates, we'll call it A1, A2. B has coordinates B1, B2, right? Then the vec the blue vector would have coordinates, uh, oh, sorry, I called it Y. The blue vector would have coordinates um, B1, minus a1 b2 minus a2 all right so let me actually write that down as a definition on the next page So let's say x is the vector. Whoops, let x be the vector. Starting at uh, a, which has coordinates a1, a2 dot 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 down to a n. This is a vector in R in n dimensional space and ending at the vector b, which has coordinates b1 through bn, then X has coordinates um, B minus A, which is B1 minus A1 down to Bn 
minus a n. Right, so as an example, let's say that a has coordinates 0, 1, 3, b has coordinates negative 1, 2, negative 5, then the vector Let x be the vector from a to b. Right, then x has coordinates negative 1 minus 0, uh, 2 minus 1, negative 5 minus 3. you can simplify to minus one, one, minus eight, right? And that's the components for the vector x. Okay, so x starts at the origin and ends uh, at the point negative one, one, negative eight. Okay, but that's considered the same vector as the vector from a to b because as you'll see, it has the same uh, length and the same direction as that vector, right? Um, let me talk about length next. I think he defines that right after. Yeah, so let's define the how you find the length of a vector. Okay, the length of the vector, which is denoted like this, it kind of looks like an absolute value sign, but it has double bars around it, right? So the length of that vector is given by the formula Right, so x1 squared all the way up to, uh, added all the way up to xn squared. Um, this is a sort of like a generalization of the Pythagorean theorem. This comes from Pythagoras. Uh, so, for example, in R2, let's say we have this vector x. It has x component x1. It has y component, whoops, y1. So here, notice you have a right triangle. So, and the length of the leg here is x1. The length of the leg here is y1. So the length of the vector x by the Pythagorean theorem is x1 squared plus y1 squared square root, All right? Um, or maybe I should call this x1 squared so it's not confusing. This would be x2, I guess. And so x1 squared plus x2 squared square root. And you can generalize this to three-dimensional space and even to n-dimensional space. Uh, I'll just show you the picture for three-dimensional space because obviously I can't, uh, I can't draw four-dimensional space and upward. Uh, but you can prove this that it, let me make this look a little bit better. You can prove this in general by using um, induction. All right, let's say that we have uh, the vector so this would be the vector here let's call that x All right 
Um, notice that this is a right triangle. The length here is given by And the height would be, let's say, x3. Um, the the uh, length of the vector x, which is this one here, uh, would be the base, the length of the base, plus, uh, sorry, the square of the length of the base, plus the square of the length of the height. Um, the, the base of this uh, triangle here, notice, is given by, uh, maybe I'll call this vector, uh, what um, a uh, let's call it a I don't know. So the base of that that triangle has length x one squared plus one uh, x two squared square root. Um, so if we and then the you know the height would be x three right. So the the length of the vector x then. would be the square root of the length of the base, which is x1 squared plus x2 squared, square root squared plus x3 squared. And when you square the square root, you get x1 squared plus x2 squared plus x3 squared. And that's the length of that three-dimensional vector. And it generalizes to n-dimensional vectors. All right, so that's the definition of the length of a vector. Uh, once we have the notion of a length, uh, let's see, what do I want to talk about next? We could talk about unit vectors next since we just talked about length. Uh, I'll just give you the definition. Uh, a unit vector which maybe I'll call it u for unit a uh, unit vector is a vector whose length is 1 okay or in other words the in symbols, that would be the length of the vector u is one. Okay. And if x is any non-zero vector, then we can find a u, u uh, sorry, a unit vector in the direction of x by taking x divided by its length. All right, um, so just as an example, let's say we have a vector with components one, two, the length of vector x is square root one squared plus two squared, or in other words, square root of five. So the unit vector in the direction of x would have components uh, one over square root five, two over square root five, right? Which you can check if you uh, to find the length of u, you'll, you'll see that it has length one. Um, that brings me to the definition of two operations that we can perform on vectors. So we can perform two important uh, 
operations on vectors. The first one is called scalar multiplication. Right, which is defined like this. So if C is a real number and X is an N tuple, we define the scalar multiplication, which we denote like this C times X. This is defined to be the vector where all of the components are scaled by the same factor. Okay, it's called scalar multiplication because uh, the geometric effect of multiplying a vector by some scale, non-zero scalar, or even by a zero scalar, uh, is it stretches or shrinks it. In other words, it, it scales it by some amount. Uh, or it can change the direction of the vector. So geometrically, this scales the length. What's, what's the length of? of x by a factor of absolute value of the scalar also if c is positive then cx points in the same direction as x. And if c is negative, it is reflected through the origin. Right, so just to give an example of that, let's go back to our trusty example of one, two. And let's say that uh, we have two scalars. Let's say C is the scalar two, and let's say uh, D is the scalar negative two. Right, so if I draw the vector one, two, we already know what that looks like. This is what one, two looks like. That's the vector X. If we, uh, let's define the vector Y to be the vector C times X, or in other words, two X, right? This has components two, four, based on the definition. If I graph that, maybe I'll do this one in red, or actually I have to write some more components though, uh, coordinates, I mean. Say this is three, four, two, three, four. All right, the vector with co coordinates two, four looks like this. So notice that it points in the same exact direction as, <clears throat> excuse me, as the vector X, and it's twice as long. It has twice the length. Okay. Whereas if we look at <clears throat> Mm 
negative two times the vector x. We get negative two, negative four as the components or the coordinates. And that would look like, I'll do, do this one in blue. That would look like this. Right, this is the vector y. So notice it has the same length as two y, as uh, y, but it points in the opposite direction. It's reflected through the origin. All right, so that's the effect of scalar multiplying, the geometric effect of scalar multiplying. Uh, we can also uh, add, so the second operation is addition. We can add vectors. Why am I writing this in blue? So vector addition. All right, so if you have two n tuples, x and y, then, you know, x has n coordinates, y has n coordinates. We define the uh, the sum of these two vectors to be the vector with coordinates that look like this. Okay, so you just add component wise. So you add x1 to y1, and that's the first component. Add x2 to y2, that's the second component, and so on and so on, all the way down to the end. All right, so that's how we define vector addition. There is a geometric way of visualizing vector addition as well. Let's say that we have a vector x here, and let's say we have a vector y here. This is x, this is y. Okay, the sum, the way that you can think about this geometrically is, so if you're adding component wise, this is x1 here, this is x2, and y has components y1, y2. So uh, if we add x, actually I'm gonna have to make some more room for this. So if I add x1 to y1, we end up with that uh, length on the x-axis. Okay. Uh, actually, let me make this a little bit more exaggerated, just so it's easier to see the picture here. It might be kind of difficult to see what I'm trying to say from that picture. Yeah, I think that'd be better. So X has components X1, X2. This is Y2. This is Y1. All right, so if we add these two vectors component wise, we're adding the, the length X1 to Y1. Okay, and we're adding x2 to y2. So um, this would this distance here would be uh, y2 plus x2, right? So that brings you up here. All right. So notice that um, oh, actually I want this on this side. That gives me uh, the point that represents the sum of the two vectors, which looks like this. And notice that 
all I've done is trans whoops, translate this triangle here over here. Right? And that gives me, so this vector here is x plus y. This is the vector x. This is the vector y. Right, so uh, what, what that does geometrically is uh, you could just think about taking the vector x and sliding it along the vector y so that its base starts at the head of y and then its tail will point towards the sum of the two vectors. Or in other words, if you draw a parallelogram here, the sum of the two vectors, I don't know if this shows up as well, just because the XP pen doesn't want to cooperate with me. Shoot. You can see the parallelogram that I'm drawing here. The, the sum of the two vectors are, is the diagonal, the long diagonal of that parallelogram. That's called the parallelogram uh, rule for vector addition. Uh -huh. right, so you can think geometrically about the sum of two vectors that way. And actually, so if you look here, let me change the color. If you add a, a y to x, that means you go along y, and then you add x to y, you end up at the sum. But notice you could have done it the other way. You could have started by going along x and then adding y to it, and you get to the same point. So from the picture, it should be clear that vector addition is commutative. Which you can also prove by just looking at the, the definition here, because the components are made up of real numbers and real number addition is commutative, it's the same thing. So uh, you, it doesn't matter if you add x and y, x plus y, or if you take y plus x, you get the same vector. All right, um, let me give another definition here since we were just talking about parallel vectors. Uh, two vectors are parallel If there exist scalars, C and D, such that X equals C times Y, and uh, Y equals d times x. All right, so that's what it means for two vectors to be parallel. Um, I won't go over the geometric uh, notation of, uh, sorry, the geometric concept of what it means for two vectors to be parallel. Hopefully you remember that from high school ge geometry, they, they have the same direction, right? So I won't draw a picture of that. Um, All right, the last two things here are just an example and a proposition that he has uh, from uh, Euclidean geometry, just to illustrate how um, using vectors uh, gives a nice interplay between coordinate geometry and uh, Euclidean geometry in, in that it makes uh, stating and s uh, proving certain theorems uh, very straightforward. So I'll do the example and the proposition that he has, uh, excuse me, in the book, and uh, then I'll end the video there. So here's the example that he does.
Okay, so this is the, the example that he he gives. Um, let me draw the picture so you can see what it's trying to say. So let's say we have two vectors. I'll do one in blue and one in red. So let's say this is the vector A. You could also think of it as the point A. Or actually, let me let me draw it as a point first. Right, so let's say A is this point here, and B is this point here. And we want to find the midpoint between the, the two the, on the line segment connecting the two. Actually, that purple doesn't show up as good. Let me just first draw the. So this is the whoops, this is the line segment connecting A and B. You can think of that as a vector, notice. Right. And the midpoint. Maybe green will show up better. The midpoint of that line segment is the point halfway halfway from A to B. So we want to show that uh, this vector AM. Um, what color should I use? Purple. We want to show that the vector here AM is given by uh, one half the vector AB. So what we can do is so let's think of a as a vector starting at the origin so now this is a vector a and i'll draw a vector here to b so now b is a vector and the the um the line segment ab so st the vector starting at a and ending at b is given by just from the definition is given by b minus a oh i didn't talk about subtraction of vectors i'll do that afterward um or maybe actually you know what because i'm using subtraction here i should probably do it first darn i forgot to do that let me do that on the next page and then i can erase it and come back uh subtracting vectors All right, um, so we define x minus y uh, in terms of the coordinates. You just subtract the coordinates. So this would be x1 minus y1 down to xn minus yn. And there's a geometric notion of this as well. Let's say this is x. And let's say this is y. All right, you can think of x minus y is the vector you add to y to get x. All right, so from the picture, I'll, I'll draw this difference vector in red. So it's the vector that you add to y to get x, which is this vector here. So the red vector is x minus y. Okay, you could also think of it in terms of adding additive inverses. So or x minus y is the same thing as x plus minus y, right? So if you draw minus y, which I don't have enough space to do, of course, uh, minus y would point like that, right? In the opposite direction. So here, if you add uh, minus y to x, you would end up uh, with the same vector. Right, so um, that's the notion of um, subtracting vectors. So going back then to the pr the example that we're looking at, now we know what uh, a, B minus A means, All right? Um, what was I doing? 
uh, I wanted to show that AM is one half of, um, so the green vector, let me draw that here. So I want to show that this green vector is one half one half a b. So uh, the green vector a um. How do I want to do this? It's, so if you look at the picture, uh, should I write this in colors? Um, this is the vector, let me, draw the purple vector here. So I want to show that this vector AM, this one here, is equal to Uh, one half a b, um, which again a b is the vector b minus a. So we can do. How do I get to the green point here? I can do a plus a m Right, so I know this vector here, since it's the halfway point from A to B, it has to be, one half, it has to be one half B minus A by what we learned from scalar multiples, because that's the geometric definition, right, of the halfway point. So this ve this vector should have uh, coordinates one half b minus a. So if we take uh, just using the geometry here, um, should I use a different color? Let me use orange. So to get to the to the green vector, we would have to go along a, and then we'd have to go along a m, right? So we would do. Uh, how do what do I name the green vector? Maybe I'll call it. Uh, let me. I'll call it um, M. I guess. So the green vector will be M. I'll draw it in green so it's clear. So the the vector M just from the geometry is equal to A plus A M, right, which is A plus one half uh, B minus A, which is, whoops, A plus one half B minus one half A. And A minus one half A is one half A. This is one half A plus B. Uh, which is one half 
uh, AB. All right, so uh, that shows that, that that property is true, All right? So AM is given by one half uh, AB, that's the midpoint, okay? Uh, using the definitions that we looked at before. Okay, uh, that's just an example that he does in the book. Um, the next one, I think I have an extra, pa more pages here, is a proposition. So let me write down the proposition. He calls this proposition 1.1. Get the medians of a triangle. intersect at a point uh, that is two thirds of the way from each vertex. Uh, to the opposite side. All right, so we're going to prove this using some of the stuff that we just learned. So I'll start by drawing a picture. We're going to start by drawing a triangle, uh, and it'll be easiest if we put one of the vertices at the origin. So let's say we have a triangle that looks like this. Right? And I'll connect each of the vertices with the midpoints opposite to it. Uh, whoops, that's not connected to a vertex. So this should go like this, and this should go like this. And again, the XP pen doesn't want to draw straight lines. Let me see if I could do a little bit better than that, though. All right, so um, we want to show that the, the point where all three of these things intersect, this point over here, maybe I'll call that point C, uh, we want to show that that always happens um, at a distance of uh, two thirds of the way from each vertex to the opposite side. So um, let's take three points on, just using the picture here, uh, let's say that we have three points that are two thirds you know, that satisfies that definition. So this, let's say this point is P, let's say this point is Q, and let's say that uh, this point here is R. And we're drawing them so that they don't coincide. Uh, it's the proposition says that they do, but let's show that they do. All right, so we want to Go back to black ink. All right, so how can we do this? Um, we could, uh, let me give some names to these sides of the triangle. Let's say this this uh, vector here is A. This vector here is B. Uh, then these points here, the midpoints, I'll call them M, A call this one MB. Uh, 
and I'll call this one MAB since it's the midpoint of A, A and B. All right, um, so let's see where P is. Uh, I'll write it in purple just so it's clear what I'm talking about. So the point P, right, this, this point P over here, Okay, is the point two thirds from uh, away from the um, uh, from the vertex A, right? So to get to that point, we would have to go along A, and go two thirds down um, the you know the vector starting at A down to M B, right? So uh, let me write that down. This would we would have to go along A and add two thirds of the vector, uh, what is that, uh, AMB. A okay, and the vector uh, the vector AMB, uh, AM, uh, M, the vector MB remember is one half B, it's the midpoint of the vector B, right? Um, that would be one half B minus the vector A. And that gives me A plus one third B minus two thirds A, which is the same thing as one third B uh, a uh, a minus two thirds a is one third a so plus one third a or in other words one third a plus b all right uh, that's the that's the point p uh, let's take a look at the point q next. All right, to get to the point Q, we have to go along B. So we'll, we'll take B plus uh, two thirds of the vector going from B to MA. Which is equal to B plus two thirds uh, M A is one half A okay, minus B. And when you simplify that, you get B plus one third A minus two thirds. B, which uh, B minus two thirds B is one third B. So notice that you actually get the same thing, right? And then lastly, we have to look at R, which uh, I'm running out of space for. So maybe I'll do it on the next page. Uh, so R Let's see, how do we get to R? We go two thirds of the way from uh, uh, to uh, MAB, right? So and MAB is one half A plus B. That's what we showed uh, in the last example. A, which gives you one third A plus B, which is what we got for P and Q as well. So notice P equals Q equals R, which is the point C. 
right? And that shows that the proposition is true, okay? Using uh, vectors. So there's a, a nice interplay between um, coordinate geometry um, using vectors and um, Euclidean geometry. So, and then there's a couple of exercises uh, in the exercise set for chapter one that has some problems like this in it. So maybe we'll do one uh, of them in addition to the two problems that he recommends. So um, this video is a little bit longer than I thought it was going to be, but that's the end of chapter one. I'm going to do the exercises in the next video in this uh, uh, playlist uh, for Schifrin and then uh, be on the lookout for uh, other videos for calculus by Spivak. Um, I still am doing the, that playlist and I'm going to start on a, cal on a uh, physics book also. All right, guys, I'll see you next time.